We never feel adequately prepared for Rosh Hashanah, Yom Noroyim. But I think a year such as this is especially so. It's a cruel trick that the calendar has played on us that it's still August and we're standing at the threshold of Rosh Hashanah. So let me begin with a story that may give us some hope. The Baal Shem Tev used to select one of his disciples to be the Baal Tekeya, to blow the shofar every year. And he would teach that disciple the various kavanas, the mystical intentions of the various sounds of the shofar. One year, the disciple he picked was named Revolve Kitsis, great Talmud Chacham. And uh, he sat with him and taught him the meaning of the tiki and the shvarim and the true and each time it's blown and the mystical kavanas. Now this Revolve Kitsis did not have a great memory. So he wrote down all the intentions on a piece of paper, which he planned on referring to during the show for blowing. Now at this point, you probably can guess what happened, that he lost a piece of paper. So it came Rosh Hashanah, and he could not have any of the lofty intentions when he blew the shofar. He was very disappointed. He was heartbroken. But after Rosh Hashanah, the Baal Shem called him over and said, I have to tell you that this year the Tkiah Shafer was unimaginable. What it was able to accomplish in the lofty regions of heaven is indescribable. So Revolve said, Rebbe, but I didn't have any of the mystical intentions. I couldn't think of this kavana and this kavana. What could it have achieved? So Baal Shem said, let me explain. You know, between us and the Ribbana Shleilam, there are many barriers, there are many doors. And each kavana, each of the mystical intentions, is like a key that can open another door. So this kavana opens the first door, and that kavana opens the second door, and that kavana opens the third door. But there's something that opens all the doors. It's called an axe. If you have an axe, you can break down all the doors. The Pasuk says, Leiv nizhbar v'nidke elekim le'sivze that a broken heart, a contrite heart, God does not scorn. That's what we had this year. Precisely the fact that you lost the paper and could not have these lofty kavanas means you approached the shofar with contrition, with a broken heart. And that was the master key. That was the ax that broke down all the barriers. I think for all of us, the very sense that we are not adequately prepared may be the greatest schus that we all have, that we all approach this Rosh Hashanah with an unusual measure of contrition, an unusual measure of fear, perhaps. And perhaps that will be the merit through which we'll all be zochet to the ksiva v'chasim tova. But we still have a few bays, so to the extent that we can, let's see if we can get ready. I'd like to ask two questions. I think these are the two basic questions we all are trying to answer. The first is, how can we win our case? We're going to be judged, and a lot is on the table. Life, health, sustenance. So how can we win? Ideally, we should be innocent. But if we can get off on a technicality, it's also not so bad. <laughs> so the question is, is there any loophole, any legal maneuver we can use to be zayich bedin, to merit a good year this Rosh Hashanah? And the second question is a longer-range question, which is, what exactly should we take out of the Yom Noroyim for the rest of the year? It's not just a question of getting over the hump. But in what ways can the Yom Neroyim set the tone for the months beyond? I'd like to take these questions up one at a time. I'd like to give you three eitzes, three bits of advice that are cited in many svarim that have the power to arouse divine mercy and perhaps tip the scales of judgment in our favor. Chazal say, this is number one, Chazal say, 
If a person is willing to forego his own preferences, ma'avirin al kol pshav, the Rebbeinu Shleilam overlooks all his sins. Sometimes you meet a person for whom everything has to be just so. Everything has to be exactly the way he likes it. It can't be off by the slightest amount. His food, his clothing, his car, the way people speak to him, everything has to be just so. Then there are other people for whom it's good enough. It's good enough. Let me tell you a story. The Bab of a Rebbe, Rup Shloyma, Zechatzadik Lebracha, at his funeral, you can imagine it was well attended by Hasidim, there was a certain black fellow who was a house painter by profession. And he attended the funeral. And uh, someone noticed him and uh, realized that he didn't apparently belong to this Hasidic dynasty. So he asks the fellow, well, what brings you here to this uh, funeral? So the man says, this is my rabbi. This is my rabbi. <coughs> what do you mean? He says, I'll tell you a story. That I was once called to paint his house. And I came in, knocked on the door, he opened the door, and the first thing he says to me is, tell me, have you had breakfast yet? I told him no. So the first thing, he served me breakfast. Baba Rebbe served him breakfast. After that, after breakfast, the Rebbe said, listen, so I just want you to know, I don't expect a perfect job. There was only one place that was ever perfect. The Beis Hamikdash in Yerushalayim was perfect. But after that, after the destruction of the temple so many years ago, there's nothing in this world that's perfect anymore. It just has to be good enough. So don't strain yourself to do a perfect job. It's good enough, it's good enough. That's the idea of being maver al midaisav. And we have to train ourselves, we have to train our children to be more flexible, more willing to give in. There's a story I often tell. The Sfasemas was raised by his grandparents, the Chidush Yarim and his Rebetzin. He was an orphan. And uh, one day, the Rebetzin served kasha for lunch. I assume everyone loves kasha here, right? It's one of those things which some people like it, some people don't. But the Rebetzin served kasha that day. And the young man said, I don't like kasha. And his grandfather said, what? <laughs> what did he say? He doesn't like kasha. He told his wife, told the Rebetzin, the Rebetzin, for the next month, serve him kasha every day for lunch. <laughs> and the Svasemis told the story over years later, and he said, and you know, now I like kasha. <laughs> but I don't know if that really is true, that he likes kasha as much as he learned that it's not so important that you have to have exactly what you like. It has to be good enough. It's nourishing, it's filling, well prepared. It's good enough. It doesn't have to be perfect. Kalamavra al-midaisav. If a person takes that approach to life, the Rebbeinah Shleilam treats him the same way. If you insist everything has to be just so, the way you like it, so the Rebbeinah Shleilam is justified in taking the same position. Listen, I also have preferences. I want things to be a certain way. It should be exactly the way I want it. But if you are flexible and you say, it's good enough, the Rebona will also say, you know, it's good enough. Very, very powerful Eitzah. To be a Mavra al Midaisav, the Rebona Shlaila, measure for measure, will do the same. Number two, the Gemara in Mesecha Shabbos says that if a person judges other people, Lakaf Schus, if you judge other people favorably, then you are also judged favorably. Now, this is a very difficult concept to understand. You see, when we are down le kafschus, we take that to mean we give the person the benefit of the doubt. The person did something. It's hard to tell exactly what he had in mind and what he actually did. So I don't know. Okay, give him the benefit of the doubt. The Rebona Shloilam can't give the benefit of the doubt. He knows. It's like I'm reminded years ago when I was with Ur Sameach and we had questions and answers. So someone once asked the question, 
does the Ribbon Shlalem have a sense of humor? So I said, I don't know if he has a sense of humor, but one thing I can tell you, you can't tell him a joke. <laughs> says, Why? He knows the punchline before you say it. <laughs> he knows everything. He knows everything. So what does it mean that the Ribbon Shlalem should judge someone like Hafschus? I think it means this. And let me bring it out with an amazing insight. There's a Sefer, Derech Mitzvah Secha. It was written by the Tzemach Tzedek, the third Lubavitcher Rebbe. And he writes the following amazing thing. You know, sometimes a person can acknowledge his own faults, but as soon as someone else points them out, he becomes indignant. Let's say I would tell you, you know, I'm really a lazy person. I have a hard time getting out of bed, and I'm not motivated. It's, it's, it's terrible. And you would say, you know, you're right. You really are a lazy person. <laughs> Wait, you're calling me lazy? <laughs> I'd, be, I'd be furious. Uh, how do you understand that? If I can acknowledge my own faults, why is it that as soon as someone else points them out, I become upset? So the Rechman Tzvesecha says like this. He says that when a person looks at his own faults, he sees them within a context of virtue. It's true, I have a fault, but I have many virtues. I'm a good person and a kind person and a fun person, nice person in so many ways. Okay, nobody's perfect, I have a fault too. So when I look at my own faults, it's within the context. But when I look at someone else's faults, all I see, I zero in with my laser-guided critical eye on that person's faults. That's all I see. All I see is a big zero. And that is very painful. So I can acknowledge my own faults, but as soon as you take note of them, I become very, very upset. And the Derech Mitzvah says an amazing thing. You know, there's a famous statement of Hillel. The Hillel said, My disoni loch lochavach lo sabbat. That which is hateful to you, don't do to somebody else. And that could include many things. You know, you don't want someone to park in your space, don't park in his space. But the Derech Mitzvah Secha says the one thing that is most hateful to people about which Hillel was specifically speaking is exactly this, not to look at another person's faults in isolation, only to see his faults in a total picture. I heard from my Rosh Hashiva, Rudiman Zechat Tzadik Levrach, he once said a, a tight a twist on a statement of Chazal, Chazal say, Don't scorn any man. But that can be translated differently. Don't scorn the entire man. Everyone has faults. But don't take that fault to be a total disqualification of the person. Don't scorn the totality of the person. See the person's fault in a context. When the Ribbon Shlalom judges a person, we tend to think that all the mitzvahs, all the Adairas are put on the scale of judgment, and there is a context. There is a picture of the totality of the person that is generated by the process. But you know, when we look at other statements of Chazal, we get a different impression. Chazal tell us that there are certain Adairas that if a person commits, he loses his share in the world to come. Now what does that mean? The Gemara says if a person shames someone else, he loses his share in the world to come. And what does that mean? Even if he has so many more mitzvahs? It seems to mean that. Now, there are certain sins that are so severe that even if otherwise the person is raiv zuchuyas, he's mostly meritorious, but if he has that avera, then the Kaddish Baruch says we're going to focus just on that. And on that basis alone, he will lose his share in the world to come. Which is not uh, difficult to understand. Because in an earthly court, it certainly is that way. When a person is on trial for a crime, and he's charged with a certain offense, the earthly court doesn't consider whether he's a good father or a good husband or an honest person. The question is, did he commit that offense, the offense that he's charged with? Sometimes, perhaps, it's that way in heaven, too. But that's al pimida sadin. That's according to the strict letter of the law. But what if we have Midas Arachim and we have divine mercy? It may be that even in that instance, 
the offense is viewed in the context of virtue. And that's what Chazal say, that if a person judges others favorably, he looks at their faults in the context of goodness, the Rebona Shleidam will judge you the same way, and that can make a big difference. And we have to make this a habit. You know, I, I don't want this to become a political speech, but I will throw in a little bit that this past summer has been a very, very hot summer. A summer where there was great polarization within the religious community in North America and Israel over very, very serious political issues, religious issues. You know, a dispute is a dispute. And I don't believe that everyone should just say, let's all get along and obliterate all differences. But the Gemara tells us an interesting thing. The Gemara tells us that there were two factions in uh, the Jewish community. There was Beis Hillel and Beis Shammai. And they disputed dozens and dozens and dozens of points of Jewish law. Over 250 points are recorded in the Talmud. Maybe there were more. And yet, it says in the Gemara that their children married each other. And there was Ahav of Areus, and there was love and friendship among them. Lekayim Mashinamar, and this fulfills the verse, they love truth, and because they love truth, they very vigorously debated their positions, but they loved peace as well. And it's a shame. A machloikas, a dispute, especially a machloikas l'shem shamayim, doesn't have to result in bitterness and acrimony. There can be a debate, and a tough debate, and the issues are thrashed out, and yet... We can marry each other and be friends with each other and love each other. And the root of it all is exactly this point. If I look at you and all I see is that error, that mistake that I believe you're making, I don't see or know anything else about you. I focus just on that point of disagreement. I am looking at you without benefit of context. But if I look at the total person and I see in so many ways you're a good person and you're a decent person and you're a conscientious person and you're a devout person, okay, there's a point about which I disagree, I take issue. Then I believe we could have the Ahav of Areus, the love and the friendship, even at the same time that we very, very strongly argue over a point of philosophy or a point of practice. That's number two. Number three. Let me bring it out this way. The Mishnah says in Masechus Rosh Hashanah that on Rosh Hashanah, every human being passes before the Rebbe Shalom one at a time. Single file. Every person is judged individually. And then the Mishnah says, but then, kulam niskarim beskira achas. Then every person is examined with a single look. HaKadosh Baruch Hu simultaneously looks at all humanity. The question is, what is this idea, this dual judgment? First, we're judged one at a time, and then Niskar and Beskira Achas. We're all viewed simultaneously. There's an idea, the Balai Musr say, that when a person is judged in Rosh Hashanah, it's not only his own personal merit that's a factor. To the extent that we interact with one another, to the extent that we make a difference in the lives of one another, then I may merit life and prosperity not for myself. Maybe I myself am undeserving. But the people that rely on me, the people that depend on me, in their merit, I may be given life. Let me give you an illustration. Imagine a person who owns a business and he has 100 families, 100 employees, and 100 families in turn who are dependent upon him. And the business is all in his head. If he was to go, the whole business would collapse, everyone would be on the street. So this person himself may not, not be deserving of a good year. But on the other hand, the 100 families that he's supporting are deserving, and in their merit, he'll be inscribed for a good year. Let me tell you an even bigger chidush. This is an amazing thing. There's a story told in the Yushalmi 
that uh, Alexander the Great once went to visit a certain city. He wanted to see what the legal system was in that city. So uh, as he was speaking to the judges, a case came before them. There were two people. A person purchased a field, and the field had a dump on the field. And he was uh, going through the dump, and he discovered a chest filled with coins, treasure. So the buyer said he wants to give back the chest. He bought a field and a dump. He didn't buy a treasure chest. So he wants to give it back. The seller said, says, no, I'm not taking it back. He says, I sold the whole field, lock, stock, and barrel. I'm not taking back the chest. This was the dintire. This was the case that came before them. So a uh, very difficult case, right? The seller wants to give the chest. The buyer wants to give the chest. So the judge says, tell me. He asks the one, do you have a son? He says, yes, I do. He says, do you have a daughter? He says, yes, I do. So I have a very simple solution. Let them marry each other, and uh, they'll share the treasure. And they were overjoyed. The two litigants were overjoyed. It was a perfect solution. That's what happened. Alexander the Great started laughing. He said, what are you laughing at? Well, we didn't judge properly. So he said, well, if this case came before me, I would have said, kill both, and I'll take the chest. <laughs> So uh, to these people, it was so odd. What, what a, he's such a desire for money that he would kill two people for money. Inexplicable. So then what happened was uh, Alexander the Great was visiting, so they, they prepared a banquet for him, and they served him loaves that were made of gold, solid gold. So imagine you're giving a loaf, solid gold. So Alexander the Great says, says, I can't eat this. So they say to him, well, if you can't eat it, why do you like it so much? <laughs> so you said you're willing to kill for it. I mean, if you can't eat it, why do you like it so much? Anyway, so you can figure where this conversation is going. So finally, they say to Alexander, he says, tell me, does it rain where you live? So he says, yes, it does. Does the sun shine where you live? He says, yes, it does. And they look at him and say, tell me, are there any sheep where you live? And he says, yes, lots of sheep. So now it makes sense. He said, for a person like you, the sun shouldn't shine and the rain shouldn't fall. But it must be, because since there are sheep, <laughs> and they need the sun and the rain, so it, it rains for them. And this is what the verse says. The verse says, we said it at Mincha, Adam uvehema teshiya Hashem, God saves man and animal, man and animal, Sometimes he saves the man for the sake of the animal. Meaning the man himself doesn't deserve life. But if he were to die, who would take care of his flocks? Who would take care of his herds of cattle? So HaKadosh Baruch Hu gives the person life for the sake of his animals. And by the way, this is not so far-fetched. If you look at the last verse of Sefer Yonah, that's exactly what it says. That the people of Nineveh were given life for the sake of their children and the sake of their cattle, their animals. Now this idea, I heard from my Rosh Hashiva the first time many, many, many years ago. Probably 35 years ago. He was speaking in Rosh Hashanah, and he said this idea how a person who otherwise isn't deserving is given life because of the benefit he provides for the world. And he gave a martial illustration. This was at the height of the Cold War. This is in the 70s. And he says, imagine a person, a scientist, who could design a weapon that could keep the Soviet Union at bay. You know, it's hard to imagine, but uh, back in the 70s, this was a concern. So that person, even if he personally was undeserving, would be given life. That was the example he gave. That's the person that the world needed, a person, a scientist that could design this weapon that would keep the Russians at bay. Anyway, that afternoon, Rosh Hashanah, I was walking, and I ran into the Rosh Hashiva, and the Rosh Hashiva asked me if I heard his talk. He said, yes, I did. So he asked me if any comments, any thoughts. So I said, well, perhaps the marshal. The illustration. Was it so necessary that we have a person that could design a weapon to keep the Soviets at bay? So he said to me, Vos, du bist a Bolshevik? <laughs> Are you a, a Bolshevik, a communist? <laughs> like, like, why can't you understand this? <laughs> it should be so obvious. But this is the idea. The idea is that sometimes we are given life, we are given life, not for ourselves, but for the people that rely upon us. There's a letter from Abishol Salanter, Ari Yisrael, the third letter, 
where he writes that when Rosh Hashanah comes, we all are concerned because the instinct to self-preservation is so strong. But he writes, the only Eitzah, the only advice I can give you, he wrote to his correspondent, is to make yourself a person who is indispensable to your community. If you involve yourself in the affairs of your community, then you could merit life, even if otherwise it would not be the case. And I think that's something very, very, very important for all of us. In small ways and in big ways, we have to involve ourselves in Klal Yisrael, on the global level, our shul on the local level, our families on the micro level. But the extent to which we make a difference in the lives of other people may be the schus for which we will be given more life. And uh, knowing this wonderful congregation in this shul, there are dozens and dozens of ways that a person could become more involved and more active and more supportive. And I will leave that to the Rav, to the Gesund, and to the lay leadership to provide practical opportunities. But when those opportunities knock, take them. Because they are not asking you to give something. They are asking you to take something. Now, there's a marshal I once heard the once was a very miserly person, very, very stingy person. Never gave anything, never gave money. So once he went swimming, and he was drowning. So the lifeguard came out to save him, and the lifeguard said in Yiddish, give me your hand, give me your hand. So the fellow said, ich gib nicht, I don't give. <laughs> so the lifeguard was clever, and the lifeguard said, nem meine hand, take my hand. Taking yes, that I do. <laughs> when an opportunity is given, all too often we look at it, someone is asking me to give something. Someone is asking me to be on a committee and give of my time. Someone is asking for a donation I should give of my money, and so on and so forth. It's a wrong perspective. You're not being asked to give something. You're being asked to take something. Because you will get more than you give. And it may be that that itself will be the great schus that will stand us in good stead on Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur. So to sum up this first half of the discussion, three very powerful eitzes to be zolcha bedin. Number one, that we should judge others favorably. Number two, that we should be forgiving and foregoing when it comes to our own priorities. And number three, that we should involve ourselves and make a contribution to the life and the well-being of Klal Yisrael and our own community. So now we have three powerful ways that we could win our case. But let's ask ourselves then the second question, which is really the longer-range question. What is it exactly that we'd like to take away from the Yom Nagrayim? What should last beyond, beyond Tishrei, into Cheshv and Kislev Teves, and throughout the year? And of course, there are many possible answers to this question, but let me bring it about this way. In the Rosh Hashanah night, in Shul, there's a very emotional point of the service. And we all intuit that it's a very powerful point, but most of us have no idea why that is. After the Shemun Esrei, of the first two nights of Rosh Hashanah, there's a hush in the audience, and the chazan begins reciting the capital, the David Mizmar, Lashem Ha'aretz Mulaya Tevel Viyosh Veva. Tehillim Perak Chav Dalit. Now, I will spare you the pain of having to listen to me sing it. <laughs> Nothing to fear. But uh, anyone who's been in Shul Rosh Hashanah knows that this is an emotional high point of the service. It's, it's recited in a very pensive tune, and it's fervor. You don't say it. You don't say it here? No. You're kidding. Rabbi Feld, they said Mina got for us not to say it. Uh-oh. We'll think about it. Well. <laughs> 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 No, I have to tell you. 
In our family, there's a joke that we have. I once heard it on the radio that, uh, you know, these unflappable English butlers, you know, never phased them. So uh, once one of these fellows was serving Thanksgiving dinner and uh, he's bringing out the turkey and someone puts his foot out and he stumbles and falls and the turkey falls to the floor. That's the entire dinner. What's he going to say at that point? So again, unflappable, the butler says, not to worry, Madame always prepares a second turkey. <laughs> <laughs> and he picks the turkey off the floor, brings it into the kitchen, washes it off, put it, <laughs> puts it in the oven, takes it out. Anyway. So in our family, whenever something goes wrong, we say, not to worry, Madame always prepares a second turkey. <laughs> <laughs> but in any case, many shuls have this custom <laughs> to say this to people of Tilly. <laughs> now, at first glance, there's nothing to do with the Rosh Hashanah. It really is the psalm that Shlomo HaMelech recited, according to the Gemara, when he wanted to bring the Ark into the Holy of Holies, the gates were stuck, the gates wouldn't open. And he recited this psalm. What is it with the Rosh Hashanah? You see, the Mukubalim tell us, the mystics tell us, that everything that exists in geographic space has a counterpart in time. There's a place in the world called the Beis Hamikdash. This is the holiest place in geographic space in the world. And this is the psalm of entry. This is the psalm that we recite when we are entering this holy space. Mi yala bahar Hashem, who can ascend the mountain of the Lord? Umi yakum b'mukam kacho, who can stand in his holy place? Mikikapayim of our Levov, a person whose hands are clean, who's pure of heart. A magnificent psalm. Parallel to that holy space is the holiest time of the year. And that's the Yom Nerayim. This is the Beis Amigdash in time. And therefore, this psalm, which talks about entering the spatial temple, also relates to the temporal temple, this temple of time, the holiest time of the year these days. So let's talk about the Beis Hamikdash a little bit. What was the experience of the Beis Hamikdash meant to be? And then we'll understand a little bit what the experience of the Yom Naraim is meant to be. There's a very beautiful Gemara in Masechus Psachim that points out that each of the Ovas had a different term for the Beis Hamikdash. Or with regards to each of the Ovas, it's described in a different way. In the story of Avram Avinu, the Beis Hamikdash, the site of the Beis Hamikdash is called Har, the mountain. The Akeda took place on the site of the Beis Hamikdash, and this is Bahar Hashem Yeroeh. God was seen on the mountain. So Avram Karo Har. With regards to Avram, it's called a mountain. With regards to Yitzchak, it's called a field. He went to pray in the field. That field was the site of the Beis Hamikdash. With regards to Yaakov Avinu, it's called a bias. It's called a house. When Yaakov Avinu was beginning his exile from Eretz Yisrael to the house of Lavan, he slept at that place and he said, This is the house of the Lord. Har Soda Bias. Mountain, field, house. There's an amazing thought, as an aside, there of Nachman of Breslov points out that, you know, when we pray for the restoration of the temple, we say, Restore the service to your holy temple. Restore. V'hashev. Hashev, we say in Musaf, Hashev kohanim lavodosom. Return the priest to their service. Hashev. Hashev is comprised of the letters Har Soda Bayas. Hey, Shin Beis, this Hashev. We ask God to restore the temple, to restore the dimension of mountain, the dimension of field, the dimension of bias. How do we understand these three ideas? 
Avram Avinu, when he performed the Akeda, was called upon to do something that was very, very difficult to offer his own son, and it was inexplicable. It made no sense. It was contrary to anything he believed about the nature of the Rebbeinu Shleilam that he should demand such a thing, a human sacrifice. Yet he did it. How did he come to do it? Because he saw himself in relation to the Rebbeinu Shleilam, as the Rambam describes, a person who is the Ereshamayim, a person who is in awe of the Rebbeinu Shleilam, sees himself as small, as having a unenlightened mind in comparison to the Tmim Deus, in comparison to the Rebbeinu Shleilam, whose intelligence is complete and perfect. It's true I can't understand. It's true that to me it makes no sense. But if the Rebbeinu Shleilam asks this of me, I stand in awe of him and I perform. And that's what the Rebbeinu Shleilam said. Ato yadati, now I know when Avram Avinu was willing to perform the Akedah, Kireya Lekimata. I know that you are a truly God-fearing person. That's the symbolism of a mountain. When a person stands at the foot of a lofty mountain, he stands in awe. There's a sense of majesty, there's a sense of height, of scale. That symbolizes Yira, that symbolizes reverence, it symbolizes awe of the Rebbeinu Shalom. That is the first thing, I believe, that we should take away from the Yomim Noroim, the sense of awe, the sense of reverence. That is the first aspect of the Beis Hamikdash, the spatial temple. That should be the first aspect of our temporal temple. We have to relate to the Rebbeinu Shleilam with a sense of reverence, with a sense of awe. Now, this translates itself into so many ways. When we come into the Beis Knesses, You know, there's a verse that's printed in the Siddur, Matovu. I don't know if anyone has the custom of saying it, but those <laughs> verses were to be said when a person walks into the Beis Knesses. And he says, Va'ani barov chastacha ovo vesecha. By your grace, I come into your house. Eshtachave el heichal kodshacha secha. I bow to your holy sanctuary in awe of you. That sense of awe, that sense of reverence is something that I think we've all lost. It's a very nice thing to feel heimish, to feel at home in shul. We should feel at home at shul. But we have to find that balance that somehow at the same time we are at home in shul, there is the sense of yiras hakavod. There's a reverence for the Rebbeinu Shleilam. It's not our living room, and it's certainly not our playroom. This is the Rebbeinu Shleilam's house. And we have to have that sense of fear. And when we make decisions, we have to feel ourselves as being in the presence of the Rebbeinu Shleilam. I'll mention one great segula for Yir HaShemayim. Rav Tzadok HaKoyen writes in the Sefer Tzitka Satzadik, is the proper recitation of brachas. When we say a bracha, and we refer to the Rebbeinu Shleilam as Baruch Ata, blessed are you, we aren't speaking of the Rebbeinu Shleilam as a distant being. We are standing in the presence, Baruch Ata. And Chazal say that we should say a hundred blessings every day. Something that you repeat again and again and again, a hundred times every day, sooner or later, makes an impression. If a person sees himself in the presence, then a person's life would be different. Dalif ne'miyata'omeid, know before whom you're standing. I think Yom Narayim, we feel this to a greater extent than any other time of the year. But that is the first thing that we want to carry forward. We want to carry forward this sense of awe, the sense of reverence, which is the idea of har, the idea of mountain. This is one experience of the Beis HaMikdash. It should be an experience of the Yom Neroyim that we take with us.
Then there is sada. There is sada. The field is the source of our sustenance. A Jew has to understand that the base Migdash, this is the source of the bounty which the Rebbeinu Shalom provides us. All the blessings of the Rebbeinu Shalom emanate from Yerushalayim, from the base of Migdash. From there they spread through the various channels to the entire world. Obviously, in time, the blessings of the year also flow from the Yom Arayim. It has been said that whatever happens to a person, whenever it happens to a person, really it all happened on Rosh Hashanah Yom Kippur. Because that's when the judgments took place. That's when the decisions took place. And I think we have to live with that sense that everything we have comes from the Rebbe Nishleilam. He is our sada. He is our field. He is the source of everything we have. And the truth is that it's a very funny relationship we have with him. We tend to relate to the Rebbe Nishleilam. When everything goes wrong, it's his fault. And when everything is okay, I achieve that. So we always have complaints. We're always griping about something. I don't have the amount of money I want. I don't have the covet I want. I don't have the job I want. I don't have the whatever it is I want. But the things I do have, I take for granted. I don't realize that I am the beneficiary of this bounty that he provides for me. But I think that when Rosh Hashanah Yom Kippur comes, we're forced to live up to that. Because on Rosh Hashanah Yom Kippur, we realize that our lives and our sustenance and everything that we enjoy is really a consequence of the decrees that are made on Rosh Hashanah. And of course, everybody's life has something missing. There's always something more we would like. But what is that in comparison to what we do have? If we would walk through life with a sense that Rebona Shleilam is our field, he is our provider, our gratitude, our devotion would be so much more intense. I think that's the second thing we have to take away with us. In the same way that Yitzchak Avinu experienced the Beis English as Sada, the source of our provision, so we have to see the Rebona Shleilam as the source of all that we have, and take that forward from the Yom Neroyim and beyond. And thirdly, is the idea of bias. You know, bias, the house, or better, the home. Home is one of those words that has a very warm connotation. Home is sweet home. It's relationship. It's love. Yaakov Avinu, at a time of his life, that he would have been totally justified in feeling a sense of abandonment. He's being forced to leave Eretz Israel. He sees himself embarking on a very bitter exile. And the Rebbe appears to him and says to him, I am with you. You are not alone. I will guard you wherever you go. And I will bring you back to Eretz Israel." I will never abandon you. That's a relationship. That's a home. And that's what the base of English was to Yaakov Avinu. It's interesting. That Gemara Psachim says that in Yemosa Mashiach, when the Umma Sa'ila, when all the nations of the world come to the base of Migdash, it says they will come to Beis Eloke Yaakov, the house of the God of Yaakov. And the Medrash is bothered, the Gemara is bothered, that why is the Beis Eloke described in that context as the house of the God of Yaakov? And the Gemara says they're not interested in Avram's Beis Eloke. They're not interested in the aspect of Har. They're not looking for a place where they can experience the fear of the Rebona Shloilam. And they're not looking for the place of Soda, where they can apprehend that Rebona Shloilam is their provider. They're looking for bias. They're looking to have a relationship with the Rebona Shloilam. That's what the nations of the world will want in the Messianic age. I think to a certain extent, it's true for all of us as well. What we really want in our religious life is to feel that we have some type of bond, some type of relationship with the Rebona Shloilam. 
we communicate. We relate to each other. There is mutual concern. That's the idea of bias. And I think that Yom Neroyim, through all that we do, the Avoda and the Tfilas and everything, we, we have that relationship. And it builds to Sukkot and Simchas Torah. And then something happens. It just dissipates. It goes up in smoke and thin air. They used to say a, a vertel that uh, after Sukkot, we say, Mashiv Haruach Umerid Hageshem. So they say like this Mashiv Haruach, push away the Ruchnias, push away the spirituality, Umerid Hageshem, bring down the materialism, which is needless to say, not as it should be. If we're going to take something forward from Yom Neroyim, it has to be that our temple in time is a bias, it's a house, it's a home. It's a place where we have a warm relationship with the Ribbonish Leilam. And I think, if you think about it for a moment, this is a no-brainer, that, that every relationship has to have some type of shared experience. Something, you know, imagine you, you, you meet a couple and uh, their marriage is uh, foundering. And you ask them, well, like, do you ever go out together? Do you ever do anything together? <laughs> There's no. We just are like two ships passing <laughs> in the ocean. So you know, the marriage council might say, listen, if you want to have a successful relationship, you have to have some, something you share, something you do together. It's good advice. Well, if you want a relationship with the Rebona Shleilam, it's the same thing. What do we do with him? What do we share with him? What is the, the common experience? And I think, again, the answer, which is no-brainer, is Torah. That's what we do together. It says we share ideas, we share wisdom, we share inspiration. That's what learning Torah is. Learning Torah is a relationship with the Ribbon HaShloylam. And if we're going to walk away with anything from the Yom Neroyim, it has to be a commitment to make Torah study a greater part of our lives. Not just because this way we'll know what to do, but because learning Torah is an ongoing dialogue with the Ribbon Shloilam. It's a relationship. You want to be close to him, you have to do something together. That's what we do. We think, we discuss, we argue, and we share Torah. So, again, to sum up, that there are three aspects of the Beis Hamikdash. There is Har, which symbolizes the sense of divine presence, the reverence for the Ribbon Shloilam. There is Sada, the apprehension of the Ribbon HaShloim as our provider from whom we have everything, and the sense of bias, the sense that we have a home with him, we share a relationship. And those are the three aspects of our Beis Hamikdash in time, the Yom Neroyim, that we should carry forward. That after the Yom Neroyim is over and the Sukkahs are dismantled and they're put away, we should hopefully maintain this sense of, of reverence and awe, being in the Divine Presence, the sense of gratitude and being the beneficiaries of his bounty, which is the idea of Sada, and the idea that, that we have a home together, and that's the idea of learning Torah and sharing a relationship. I just want to end with one thought, and it's also related to this aspect of the Beis Hamikdash. There's another Medrash, which makes the same observation about Har, Sada, and Bias, but in a totally different sense. Now, the Shir Shalyoim, the capital that we say on Thursdays, which also happens to be the Shir Shalyoim of Rosh Hashanah, that they do say the Yom, right? <laughs> Good. <laughs> Happy to hear that. You gotta make sure, but. <laughs> is, has a postal which says, Hariu le loke Yaakov, sound the shofar to the God of Yaakov. And the Medrash is bothered that why is the shofar related to the God of Yaakov? Not Avram, not Yitzchak. And the Medrash says the same thing. The Medrash gives a marshal. There was once a man who had an idea of building a palace. He was going to build a palace. He had a magnificent plan, a blueprint. He's going to build a palace. And he has three friends. And he decides to share his vision with his friends. He calls the first friend over. And he says, I'm going to build a palace on this spot. And that one says, you know, I know that spot. I think there was a mountain there once before. So the builder says, ah, 
He's disgusted. Then he calls over the second friend and says, you know, I'm going to build a beautiful palace on this spot. And the second one says, you know, I think there was a field in that spot before. And the builder says, ah, he's disgusted. Call over the third friend. I'm going to build a palace in this spot. And the third friend says, there always was a palace on this spot. So the, the builder is so excited, he says, he says, because you recognized that it was a palace all along, I will build the palace, and I will call it by your name. So HaKadosh Baruch wanted to build the base of Migdash. So Avram saw it as a mountain. So Hashem said, eh. Yitzchak saw it as a field. Eh. But Yaakov, hundreds of years before it was built, when it was literally a mountain and a field, he said, Ein Zekim Beis Elokim, this is the house of God. He recognized its potential before it was built. So HaKadosh Baruch Hu said that not only will I build it, it will be called by your name, Beis Elokei Yaakov. I think the greatest drawback to the spiritual growth that we're meant to experience this time of year is the failure to realize our own potential. Because we see ourselves as requiring a massive overhaul. It's like building a palace on a mountain. We're building a palace on a field. There's nothing there. And we're going to build something out of nothing, something from scratch. But Yaakov Avinu had a different perception. Yaakov Avinu said the potential is already there. It's really a, a base of English already. The kedusha of the site, the holiness of the site, the specialness of the site, it's, it's all there. It's missing walls. But it's already a base of English. So HaKadosh Baruch Hu said, that is the vision. I will build a base of English and will be called by your name, Beis of Yaakov. The Medrash continues and says that Asaf, who is the author of this psalm, he beautified his words by speaking about Hari Lelokei Yaakov, sound the shofar to the God of Yaakov. And what does this have to do with the shofar? See, the Medrashim tell us that what is shofar? Shofar is the call to repentance. Tiku b'chaydesh shofar. B'chaydesh means chachu ma'asechim, renew your deeds. Shaifar, shaprum asechem, beautify your deeds. It's the call to improvement, it's the call to repentance. It's the call to be better, as the Rambam says, that it's the wake up call. Uru Yeshene Mishanaschem, wake up you sleepy heads from your slumber. Examine your deeds and repent. But we have to overcome this one problem. We see ourselves, I'm a mountain, I'm a desolate mountain. And to turn myself into a palace is really to make something of myself which I am not yet. Or I'm a field. And to turn myself into a palace also means transforming nothing into something. But that's false. It's a mistake. Each and every one of us has the potential for greatness. Each one of us is already a base amygdash. We may be lacking walls. We may be lacking a ceiling and a floor. But what really counts, which is the kedusha, which is the holiness, which is the nobility of spirit, that each and every one of us has. And all we have to do is actualize that. That's the vision of Yaakov. So Asaf, when he referred to the shofar, said, Hariu leloke Yaakov. We sound the shofar. This is the call of the God of Yaakov. Yaakov being the one who could recognize potential before it was noted. And I think that's what we really have to understand, that each and every one of us has a tremendous legacy. Each and every one of us is a child of Avram, Yitzchak, Yaakov, Sarah, Rivka, Rachel, Valeya, the Avas, the Imos. We are the beneficiaries of generations and generations of self-sacrifice to perpetuate ideals of Judaism. We've learned so much, we've heard so much, we've experienced so much. And we're just at the threshold of the ikvasit of Mashiach, of the coming of the Mashiach. We can, we can just smell it. That the redemption is imminent. It says, it's not as difficult as it sounds. It says, most of the work already has been done. All we have to do is to actualize that potential which is latent, and then 
the invisible base amygdash will become a visible base amygdash. It may seem like a tall order, but every little step that we make brings us closer to that goal. The Rebbeinu Shalom should give us all the siyat, the shmaya, the help, and the insight, and the drive, and the determination to make this Yom Nairayim something that will not just be an experience that we will look back at with nostalgia, but a first step in really turning our lives into something that we can be proud of, truly a genuine base of English in time. Thank you for listening. Thank you for listening.